Thank you. Good catch. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So uh, the more mathematical way of figuring out what principal stresses are is actually using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So from linear algebra, I don't know how well you all remember eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, say, like, who has a strong grasp of eigenvalues and eigenvectors or remembers it well? Okay, some grasp. <laughs> Maybe any any recollection of what the word is. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'll do this for a two D matrix because that's a little bit easier first. But uh, what we can say is for for calculating eigenvalues, eigenvectors, I can say this is a complete matrix. There's some constant lambda uh, v where I can say uh, I can subtract some value along the diagonals of this stress tensor of this matrix some lambda multiply it by some vector and I'll I can get out a zero vector as a result so I'm trying to find what constant I can subtract out of here uh, and then what vector I can multiply into it to get a zero I know this vector is going to be non-zero, so I can actually say mathematically the determinant of this sigma minus lambda i is going to be zero, which determinant maybe also, does that <coughs> ring bells? Yes, okay. Uh, so this is uh, the, the eigenvalue method, or eigenvector, what do I want to call it? What did I call it? Uh, eigenvalue analysis. Let's call it eigenvalue analysis in the notes. So what I can do now for a two by two matrix, I'm not going to do it for a three by three, is I can say sigma minus lambda i in 2D is my sigma xx minus lambda xy sigma xy sigma y minus lambda the determinant of a two-dimensional matrix I'm going to take this term times this term minus this term times this term so then the determinant of sigma minus lambda i is going to be sigma xx minus lambda times sigma y minus lambda minus sigma xy squared. Ooh, there we go. Which I could also work out to be, uh, if you remember the definition, so the from Moore's circle yesterday, my, my principal stresses, my sigma 1 and sigma 2, defined in terms of my uh, can be defined in terms of the center of the circle plus or minus the radius of the circle which was that sigma x plus sigma y over 2 plus minus square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus uh, sigma x y squared if I manipulated all of this stuff uh, if you remember some uh, quadratic pulling out constants. Uh, if I'm uh, basically trying to calculate what my lambda is, I end up with a a plus or minus the square root of b four a b minus t. I don't I don't actually remember the formula off the top of my head, but you end up with basically coming back to the same formula using this eigenvector eigenvalue analysis. Once you have that, you can figure out what vector. Uh, when you subtract this, what vector actually ends up with a zero uh, vector as a result. So if we look at that tau example I showed yesterday, so uh, example pure shear, what this looks like is I have my stress is zero, tau, tau, zero. I would say now uh, sigma minus lambda i, the determinant of that. I would have a negative lambda 
which I guess is squared, so that turns into a lambda squared, um, minus a tau squared. So here I would have 0, 0, negative lambda squared minus tau squared. So my lambda is equal to plus or minus tau, which you remember from our, from our circle analysis was the same two principal stresses. So these are our sigma 1 is tau and sigma 2 is minus tau. <coughs> sigma 2 is minus tau. So now if I wanted to figure out sigma minus lambda i times v, so I could say um, sigma minus lambda i v is equal to, oh, that's not, uh, there we go. I should have written that a bit bigger. Uh, Let's start with our first one. So I have a minus tau, 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 minus tau. And I want to figure out what vector v1, v2 leaves us as a zero vector. And so I can say uh, from this, if I multiply my v in, I just need a plus one and a minus one. So my, my eigenvector here would be one minus one or minus one, one which is a line at 45 degrees, or at minus 45 degrees, which was the same direction angle that we got for the principal stress last time. So this kind of matches up what we had seen before. Yeah. In this like, method, are, is lambda always the principal stresses? Yes. V is just our direction vector then? Yes, V is the direction now that the principal stresses would be in. So the other vector, if I plugged in a positive <coughs> tau, I would get, so V1, my V2 would be 1, 1, which are orthogonal. So that means now that's that's my zero, or my 45 minus 45, or 45, 135. I can do math in my head. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, is, so this works uh, theoretically because mm -hmm. the shear stress is zero. Uh, stresses, is that correct? So that we're basically just using this whole thing to verify those. Uh, say that again. So we're looking at the matrix of the stresses and we're transforming it into a Yes. Okay. And so that's so this will only work to know if I can Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So it's not it won't like the more more circles directly from our stress transformation equation. Ah, stress transformation equations. Um, and so you can use it generally to rotate the stress in any direction, but you could you're just using the stress transformation equations at that point. Um, so the useful part of Moore's circle is, is looking at visualizing where principal <coughs> stresses are and what direction principal stresses would be in. Uh, and this does the same thing for you, except in a more mathematical way. Yeah. Thank you. So just to clarify, the V1 and V2 is like the directions of the <coughs> principal stresses relative to like the starting position. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So now we had that same, let's draw, um, that same tau, tau, pure shear on a body. And I'm going to say my principal stresses are oriented relative to my original coordinates. So if this is, um, say, 1, 0, and this is 0, 1, now this is my 1, 1. And this is my, say, minus 1, 1, or 1, minus 1, either way. And so this would be that, oh, these notes are getting real messy. This is the same as orienting that body in a different orientation and saying, now I have that uh, axial stress going one way and a compressive stress going the other way, 
Again, please forgive the, the negative in, in Arrow. Is there any time where the principal stress would not result in having uh, lack of sheer stress? Uh, no. So principal stresses always end up with, you always end up with a diagonal um, and zero shear stresses. So there's always some orientation where you can only, where you only have uniaxial stresses. Yeah, which is also something that pops out of linear algebra. Any complete matrix is diagonalizable, which, yeah, it, I, I'm not gonna get into it too much. Linear algebra, super useful. <laughs> I know, it was the worst, but. Cool. All right. <coughs> Other questions? All good? More confused than before? Less confused than before? More helpful, less helpful? Why help do you give um, two V vectors? So you have a V1 and a V2 in the V vector, but below you have um, a V1 vector and a V2 vector. Yes. Oh, why did I, why did I do this? Oh, sorry. This is just the, I could call this like a V11 and a V12. Like the, the one and two components of the V1 vector. Right. And so then you gave two vectors to the right. Right. So this would be, so I would have, uh, yeah, these are just two different eigenvectors. So I would also have uh, tau, 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 and V21, V22 is this one. I don't know if that cleared it up. <laughs> they should be switched. Thank you. <laughs> My bad. Thanks for catching that. Cool. All right. Let's move on to strain and strain transformations. So, strain. Uh, I'm gonna. We're gonna see how this goes. So, move stuff around. This is now, I think, section three point two in the notes. So strain where, so, so stress is the balance of forces in the body, relative normalized by the cross-sectional area that the forces are applied to. Strain in our body is actually just a geometric quantification of the shape change. So you don't actually need stress to figure out strain. So strain is only, only a function of shape change. Only a function of shape change in the body. So what I'm trying to do is if I have some body here uh, and that this uh, strain potato now uh, gets stretched out this way and moves over to a new direction and I have a cube in here that then gets ext extended and sheared and deformed what is now the strain in that new coordinate system. That's, and, and that strain is only a result of, of the shape that this was in originally versus the shape that it is in at the end state. So in 1D, we had defined our engineering strain. So engineering strain, to be that uh, delta L over L or L minus uh, L naught if I have some body that gets stretched out from an original length to some final length L naught and L I want to try to look at this problem first in a little bit more mathematical way, or a little bit more thorough way, uh, before diving into what strain actually is, uh, or how we calculate it fully out. So 
I'm going to say now I have some body initially here with in my coordinate system x. I'm going to ignore the y direction for now. I'm just going to look at the x direction. Initially, this body has some <coughs> length L0, and in the end state, this body gets stretched out and has some new length L. So I want to figure out an equation relating the axial stretch of this body, or the, the displacement of this body to that axial stretch. So I want to figure out if I have some point here at the end, some some point, what is what is the displacement u of that endpoint? So I can say the displacement u at my endpoint L, this u is now going to be a function of x. So the u at u at zero is zero. U at zero is zero. My u at L, I've moved some distance L minus my original length L naught. So this is the, the absolute distance change that I've undergone. So now if I want to generalize the displacement of any point in this body, again ignoring y, so this is the, the x component technically, uh, I can say my displacement in the x direction at some arbitrary point x, I know at L minus L naught, or at, at, at some x is L, I have L minus L naught, and I'm just going to scale that proportionally. So I'm going to say I have, this is how much I'm stretching at the end, and I, I want to say for some point x, it's going to scale proportionally x over L naught. So if I'm at that ori original length, that point will move L minus L naught, and if I'm at some midpoint, it'll move half that distance. If I'm at a quarter point, it'll move a quarter of that distance. So now I have a relationship for the displacement of an endpoint in a strained body, or in a, in a stretched out, strained body. From this, I want to figure out what my strain is. It turns out my strain I can directly calculate from my deformation, or from, my, from the displacement, the relative displacement in a body, as my strain now in the x direction is the derivative of u with respect to x, which is just that L minus L naught over L naught. So this is a very simple example. We end up back at that same definition of engineering strain in 1D that we had looked at before. Um, and so this is kind of a more formal way of thinking about strain in a body for a one-dimensional case. Let's look now. Yeah. Sorry, can I just clarify? So u is the displacement and x is like the position? Yes. So I can say x is a, yeah, relative to the, the corner of the body, this is the displacement of some point along the body originally uh, to some new position. Cool. Now, so this is for a, uniaxi a uniaxial stretch in a body. Let's look at uh, the other simple case, which is a simple shear in a body. So uh, this was uniaxial stretch. No, I'm just cramming things in. Uh, Uniaxial stretch. This is now my simple shear. So now I'm going to take a body, still define it relative to an xy coordinate system. And I'm going to say that body originally has some shape here and it gets stretched out by some angle, uh, what do I want to call that angle? V? V? What do they call it? Gamma. Duh. And that body gets moved by some angle gamma. So now, I'm going to say the u in the y direction, so this, this body isn't moving at all in the y direction, so my u 
of y here is nothing. As I, as I move anywhere up in the y direction, it's not going anywhere. But my u in the x direction is actually a function of my variable y instead. So specifically from the corner point, or from some point y, the displacement here, I could use trigonometry to say uh, this is my original height y, that displacement is now y tangent of gamma, or for small strain, small strain, this is just y gamma. I'm uh, making a, a small strain approximation where uh, this is like cosine of theta is approximately equal to 1 when theta is very small and sine of theta is approximately equal to theta <coughs> when theta is very small. So similarly tangent sine over cosine is just theta when theta is very small. Small angle approximation somewhere in some math class that you had taken. Uh, so now I want to figure out what the strain in this body is. So specifically I want to figure out what the what the shear strain is. So to do that let's look at my strain now as uh, in the context that I looked at matrices in before. So uh, if I have a strain now in 2D I have some strain in the x direction, some strain in the y direction, and I have some shear strain, epsilon x y. And I want to, I want this matrix to be symmetric to match up with the strain or the the stress matrix that I had before. Uh, so this, I want this x y and y x, sorry, epsilon y x to be equal to each other. But now. <coughs> So what I want to do is say my strain in the x, y is my derivative of u with respect to y, which would then be gamma. But then my derivative of y, u, y, with respect to x would be 0. And so this doesn't quite match up. This isn't symmetric. So something there is, is wrong. So what I'm going to do to compensate for that, to make sure that this is always symmetric, is I'm actually going to split the difference between these two. So I'm going to say my strain xy is equal to my xyx, which is equal to one half the difference between these two. dux dy plus duy dx which is now just equal to gamma over 2. And so this effectively, well, this is, there we go. What this is effectively doing is splitting the difference this way. So now instead of saying I have a simple shear here, I actually have half of a shear in one direction and half of a shear in the other direction, where this is now gamma over 2 and this is a gamma over 2. So I'm kind of looking at this now from a slightly different coordinate system. I'm just effectively rotating my coordinate system by a gamma over 2 to, to make this be pure shear instead of simple shear. This is now x, y. So oh. I'm going to tell you now that this isn't, so I'm going to go into stuff that's a little bit more in depth and I don't want you to worry because I'm not actually going to have you test it on it, but I feel like it's important to know to understand strain, small strain, finite strain. Uh, so I'm going to try to dive into some stuff. Okay. so. Now, actually first, questions up to here. Is this all all good? Everyone happy with where we're at so far? In, a, in like a problem setting, is, is gamma the actual angle? Or? Yes. Okay. Gamma would be the angle. Right. That was the thing that I wanted to mention. 
So, uh, if you remember the <coughs> second or third lecture when we talked about shear modulus. So, I had defined shear modulus relative to the displacement of, of a body in pure, in simple shear like this, where I have uh, some shear stress is equal to uh, G gamma, where G is my, my shear modulus here. This gamma is often referred to as engineering strain. So, engineering, engineering, shear, strain. Uh, whereas this epsilon xy is just my shear strain. Now, the relationship between engineering shear strain and shear strain is that gamma over 2. And it's because of this symmetry assumption that we're making, because I want xy and yx to be the same, and for engineering shear, I just am applying some simple shear to a body, and I can measure what that angle change is, and that's what I'm going to stick with, because that's something I can measure, which, as an engineer, is what's useful. Um, this can potentially cause headaches down the line. Uh, so later on when we, or tomorrow, when we talk about elasticity, uh, sometimes different formulations will use engineering shear strain as their, as their shear strain, and sometimes they'll use this shear strain as their shear strain, and it matters which one is which, or which one they're using, particular, this is particularly relevant for like finite element softwares, and whether if you're using the, the right or the wrong one, your, your shear strains will be off by a factor of two, or your shear stresses will be off by a factor of two correspondingly. So I'm giving you a heads up now that uh, notation-wise, if I'm using an epsilon xy, that's <coughs> shear strain. If I'm using a gamma, or potentially a gamma xy um, sometimes, or gamma y xz, x, uh, yz, that's my engineering shear strain. Yes. So tau is related to gamma by g. What is tau? Uh, tau is still my shear stress. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So this is that same epsilon xy, tau xy. But this is that we use engineering shear strain for the definition of shear modulus. Which, it, yeah, it. I don't know. It it makes things confusing. It's just convention at this point, and I'm gonna tell you what the convention is. I'm gonna go with it. Yeah, cool. So now, if I want to calculate strain generally in a three-dimensional body, and I want to look at what happens. So now, if I if I take a look at that that stress potato or strain potato that I had before, and I want to figure out some general body shape moving to some other general body shape. I can still use that gradient of deformations, but now what I'm going to say is my shear strain, let's write it out in 2D first and then maybe I'll write up the 3D one, um, is one half the gradient of my displacement plus the gradient of my displacement transformed, which in 2D is dux dx one half dux dy plus duy dx duy uh, one half duy dx dux dy and then duy dy where here my gradient is uh, d, dx, d, dy, or let's write it out like this as a vertical thing. d, dx, d, dy, technically there's a d, dz in there. Let's bring that all the way down. And my u is writing it out the other direction ux, uy, uz, uz, finding these in there. So I have the the gradient of u, Let's make that underlined, 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 because it's a vector, 
this is dux dx du x dy or no, dy dx. Yep, dy dx du z dx y du x no nope, dux dy Ugh. I can do this dux dy and then du x dz and I'm not gonna write out the rest of them because it kind of repeats from there other things in the corners there so the reason I'm showing this to you is because this is now a formal definition of engineering strain. So this is the way, say you had in a finite element solver, this is what your finite element solver is actually doing in the back end. It's calculating the, the deformation of the body or the relative displacement of the elements in the body and calculating from there what the strain is. The reason also that I show this to you is because there's actually an engineer, or this is actually a small strain assumption, and I'm not going to go into why. <coughs> I'm just going to tell you that this is a thing. So, our full strain would actually be if we wrote this out: the gradient of u, gradient of u transpose, uh, gradient of u transpose gradient of u multiplied out. So, if we wanted a, if we had a body and it was deforming some large amount, we would have basically these these second terms or the, these extra terms getting multiplied in, and these terms are something on. Uh, so, if the deformation here is on the order of some small strain, the deformation here is on the order of that small strain squared. So, if my strain is small enough, I can kind of ignore these terms. I can say, well, it's it's small. I'm going to pretend it doesn't really exist, and we end up back <coughs> at our, our infinitesimal strain formulation. But for finite strain, large strain in a body, we would actually have to use some of these higher order terms. All of a sudden the strain's nonlinear, uh, math gets really complicated, the formulations get really complicated. It's not something <coughs> that you normally do analytically much until you get to like grad level continuum mechanics. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to tell you that this is a thing. Know that the strain that we're using, just to kind of reemphasize, the strain that we're using is small strain, small deformation, uh, generally called infinitesimal strain, whereas this would be finite strain or, or large strain, and we're going to ignore all of this for the class. <laughs> so I'm not necessarily going to be testing on this or having you use these equations, but I wanted to show it to you just so you can see it and so you know kind of a formal definition. So if you keep going on with mechanics later on, it won't be the first time you see it uh, and you won't be kind of blindsided by, oh, I was using this formula the whole time. What are you talking about? There's another one. Okay. Questions, thoughts on that? Or do you want to just run away from it as fast as you can? That's all <coughs> fine. Okay, cool. I take no questions to either mean that you either understand everything perfectly or you don't want to talk about it at all. It's probably the second of those. So uh, let's talk about uh, strain gauges and strain transformations. So this actually, oh, I forgot to ask, how did, for everyone who had lab yesterday, how did it go? Good. Everything made sense. Measurements all worked. Yeah. Cool. Have you have any of you tried starting the analysis yet? No. I would recommend starting early. Although technically you need the stuff we're talking about today to, to start it. So uh, and the stuff we'll be talking about tomorrow. So let's talk for a little bit about strain gauges. So what is a strain gauge? It's the thing that you're using in your lab. So 
A strain gauge is a really thin metal foil, so you have an electrical conduction, electrically conducting pad that you tap onto. There's a thin metal foil going up and down, and then another metal pad that you would connect to. Uh, this is the shape of a strain gauge, or generally it's kind of this accordion shape. It's designed like this for a reason. So the physics behind a strain gauge are when you stretch a piece of metal, so stretching, stretching metal generally leads to a change in resistance, leads to some change in electrical resistance. So what we're doing with strain gauges is, is taking some type of metal, aligning them in the direction that we want to measure strain, and saying as, as my length changes, then that's going to create a strain in this thing that's going to change my electrical resistance that I can measure. And if I calibrate that change in electrical resistance to the applied strain, if I know, say I apply 1% strain and I get this change in R, uh, then I can figure out how much strain there is in my body. So it's designed like this because this accordion-like design makes it so that you don't get any change in resistance by moving it in the opposite direction. So you have a lot of long, slender uh, foils going in the direction that you want strain. So in the direction that you want some strain to be measured. And out of that direction, uh, similar to an accordion, there's, there's not a lot of stiffness. So it, it, you're not actually adding a lot of strain when you're, when you're pulling it in the opposite direction. So you're intentionally trying to make it only measure strain in one direction. Um, that means, so there's a couple things. The quantifying the performance of a strain gauge, you use something called a gauge factor, uh, which measures uh, strain gauge efficiency. Strain gauge efficiency. I'm just going to write efficiency. And, uh, And that gauge factor just relates the change in resistance to the applied strain uh, and normalizes it by the by the applied by the initial resistance one over R naught. So non-dimensionalizes it relative to what the in initial resistance of your of your gauge is. So this is how you would calibrate out. Uh, what the what the strain gauge is measuring generally these these gauge factors are somewhere in the order of like one to six depending on the metal but that means because when you're actually using a strain gauge you're only applying about 0.1 percent strain the actual change in resistance is really really small so what you do is use something called the wheatstone bridge that i probably don't have time to talk about so i'm not going to talk about it today um but yeah so uh, in 2D, now what this strain gauge is actually measuring, uh, epsilon x, xy, xy, y, our strain gauge is only measuring this one component. So it's only measuring the strain in one direction, which is good because then it isolates what strain component we're measuring, but it's bad because then we don't know what strains we're measuring in other directions or what the strains are in other directions. So the way we get around that is by making a strain gauge rosette. So, let's, so we take a whole bunch of those strain gauges and we combine normally three of them in, in not series with each other, at varying angles relative to each other. So I make a strain gauge rosette. Uh, strain gauge rosette. And so I have some strain gauge at one angle, some strain gauge at another angle, and a strain gauge at a third angle. Generally these, ah, I'm going to draw this further away because I need more space. Here, there. Generally, these are either set up in a 0 45 90 configuration or a 0 60 120 configuration. I think all the ones in your lab are 
zero forty five ninety. So we would define some gauge as our, our zero degree, our our A gauge, um, the, some other gauge as our as our forty five degree, which is our B gauge, and some other gauge as a ninety degree, which is our C gauge. And along that you have the strain gauge aligned with that direction of the measurement. So the way that we work with these strain gauges now is using strain transformations. So similar to what we had for uh, for the stress transformations, actually those same equations, oh, I think you pull them straight out of them. Um, but now what I want to figure out is what, what my strain is in different directions. So if I have those three strain gauges, I can say, I want to find strain in some some new direction, some epsilon x. Uh, this I can relate to strains in the the strains that I'm measuring, say as an x direction here, epsilon x, epsilon y, one half, epsilon x minus epsilon y, cosine two theta plus gamma x y over two. Note that this is my engineering strain and I have a factor of two in there. Uh, sine of two theta epsilon y prime, one half epsilon x plus epsilon y minus one half epsilon x minus epsilon y cosine of two theta minus gamma over two sine of two theta and then my gamma x prime y prime is equal to negative epsilon x minus epsilon y sine of two theta plus gamma x y cosine of two theta. So the reason I do this, uh, so now we can look at this uh, four minutes, cool, a few minutes left. So the reason I look at this in these directions is we can look at it in the context of a Mohr circle, uh, or now a Mohr strain circle. So if I only have one gauge, what I'm getting out of my circle, I'm trying to figure out, I'm, I'm only measuring axial strain, so I'm only measuring some component here, some epsilon a. And I, my other strains could be anywhere along there, and I don't know where my, what my strain in my other direction is. If I have two gauges now, I'm getting two measurements. So I'm getting two axial measurements. So I'm getting 0 0.1, 0 0.2, epsilon A, epsilon B. And my strains have to lie along those lines, but that means I could have a circle that lies between those lines. I could have a circle that just crosses those two lines. Um, and it could be kind of anything in there. So when I have three gauges, gauges, what I'm doing is pinning down what my components are. So I'm still only taking axial measurements. I know I have epsilon A, B, C, A, B, C, epsilon B, epsilon C. I know the relative angles between those gauges. So generally 0, 0.45, 90. So in a Mohr circle, I know that those are 90 degrees relative to each other. So I know that my strain now would have to be uh, 45 degrees apart. So, oh, what am I gonna do here? Let's move this over slightly. Epsilon B. Here, some center, uh, point there, point there, point there. So I know that these gauges have to be some angle relative to each other, and that this has to cross these points. Which maybe I can draw it where it crosses these points. No, that's an ugly circle. <laughs> it, Please forgive my terrible circle, but that's 
kind of the right idea, where now if you know the angles relative to these, you have three measurements along here. So those three measurements along a circle, they're only the x coordinate. You can now use that to, to figure out strains in other directions, which I'll give equations for tomorrow because we're out of time. Epsilon xy or gamma xy. Cool. So. Yeah. So if they're 45 degrees relative to each other, then 2 theta would be 90 degrees relative to each other on the circle. Cool. <coughs> yep. So tomorrow we'll talk about the rest of strain gauges and elastic transformations.